two things. It's fate. Genuinely have no idea how I'm, I'm gonna put these down. It is fine. It's fine. You do the intro thing and I'll... <laughs> I have made up a bad idea. <laughs> Gentlemen, trees and multiforms. What do you mean that you can tell that I recently started a rewatch of Doctor Who with my Patreon? I've changed nothing. Brain do be brain in today. Hi guys, it's Leanne and welcome to another video. As you can probably tell from the struggle busing introduction to this video, I, I, I did a few things. And quite honestly, I was going to come here and I was going to be like, it's okay. I mean, it's two months worth of books, right? Actually, realistically, there are four books here that came into my library in February and all of the rest of them, all of them, are from March. Because your gal rediscovered how to buy books in March. You see, I was having a little bit of an existential crisis over this box from my bingo board because I had hit the 24% mark for January, like I had read 24% of my new books for 2024 and I did feel quite accomplished when I did that and because of that for all of February and the start of March I spent a lot of time like picking up books in bookshops and being like hmm this looks like it could be a, a good book but f when? When am I going to read it? And generally the answer was I, I don't know if I would read that this year. I don't know if I would prioritise that or if that would become a TBR veteran or a rainy day book. But it turns out that the dry Saharanus of my book buying was partially due to the 60% square and also partially due to the fact that there just wasn't a lot out there that I wanted to grab. And needless to say that has been rectified because in this stack we have a combination of most anticipated books, pre-orders, books that I got for my birthday, random mood buying picks that I found and a bunch of books from some very generous publishers who clearly want to take me down. They think I'll never get to that 60% but I have a feeling that we may thwart them. So now that we are counting the books in these videos I am going to start by showing you four books that I bought over February and March that I am currently reading and that will be finished by the end of this month so we can effectively mark them off as read. The first book that I have here to show you was the book which started this landslide and it also has the dubious honour of being the one and only book that I bought on that trip, a trip which has to be labelled as the most aggressive uncomfortable that I've ever been in a bookstore ever. So more on that in a vlog coming to you guys really soon. But that book is Learning to Think by Tracy King. This is a memoir and I was actually meeting a friend for dinner right after I bought this and I handed it over and they read the blurb and they were like did you write this? Because when I say that this book is the most me book that I could have picked up. This is about Tracy who grew up on a council estate in Birmingham and I've recently become aware that you guys who are in the States do not actually know what a council council estate is. So just in case you haven't heard about them before, council estates are social housing provided by the state. So they are owned by local government and they are budget housing which is subsidised for people who are in impoverished conditions. They vary incredibly widely in living standards but they are the place where most people who were working class and impoverished grew up in the 70s, 80s and 90s so that includes myself and in Learning to Think Tracy is dealing with the repercussions of growing up in that environment. Her dad is an alcoholic and he dies very early on in this book as a result of his alcoholism which is as a result of the conditions that he grew up in. Unfortunately Tracy's mum who has agoraphobia, anxiety and a bunch of other mental health things can't really find her feet after Tracy's father dies and so she throws herself full bodily into born again Christianity and in the opening of this book on the very first page Tracy's like nine or something like that and she's sitting in her living room on her couch like it's a normal day but she's going through an exorcism. Next up I have what might seem like a bit of a random book for me but that is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Now those of you who have been around my channel for quite a while will know that I am a literature student, that is what I studied in university, with a very heavy emphasis on picking apart the 19th century novel and the canon of the 19th century novel that we have created. And during that experience I read a lot of classics and when I started my channel I was still reading a lot of classics classics but I have kind of fallen off that bandwagon more and more as the years have gone on and then the other day I was watching a tv show which kept name dropping the Count of Monte Cristo and I was like 
God! I haven't read that book in absolute years and I love it. And I went to find my university copy which looks exactly like this because this was the exact same edition and it was gone. I had at some point in the intervening years between then and university unhauled it. I don't know why I did that. Maybe the book was falling apart with my annotations. Who knows? Either way I took myself to a bookstore and I repurchased a copy and I am currently living my absolute best life rereading this. And it didn't actually occur to me until I said that out loud right now that this will actually actually count for my reread square on my bingo board go me. So in case you guys like me when I picked this up in university had only heard the name of this book but I had absolutely no idea what the plot was, Count of Monte Cristo is about a young sailor Edmund Dantes. He at the beginning of this novel finally thinks that he has landed on his feet. While they were on their last voyage his captain died leaving him in charge and the person who owns the ship when they get back to port is like hey you did a good job you can have a promotion which means that he can look after his alien father who is living in poverty and he can finally marry the love of his life. However on the day of his marriage the police storm into the venue and they are like you are accused of treason and he is promptly thrown in a tiny dank horrible little cell in a very iconic location where he remains for very very many years while he is plotting his revenge and this entire brick of a book is his extremely well plotted revenge. Not gonna lie, I did kind of forget quite how many pages this book had. It is 1,082 pages long without any of the introductions or uh, the stuff at the back. So <laughs> that's the thing that I decided for myself. But I'm having a great time. Next up are two books that I received from their publishers. One of them you will also see in that vlog and it is Dead Weight by Emmeline Klein. Please forgive my very sad tasselless book Mark Fitz got there first. The subtitle for this one is On Hunger, Harm and Disordered Eating and it is Memoir Essays from Emmeline Klein wherein she looks at her history with disordered eating but also how we got here. And she's not just picking apart diet culture and also like the weight of the medical industry. She's also looking at fashion and celebrities and insidious mindsets that just exist in our culture that it's almost impossible to pick apart. This one is a proof and it comes out on the 24th of April and I will say that while I am really enjoying the reading experience of this, this is actually a topic that I've read quite widely on. It is so readable but it's also very very heavy and it does not shy away from the real honest realities of this topic. So I don't necessarily think I'd recommend this as the first place that you start if you'd like to read more about disordered eating. Yes we will also finish this one this month. And then last up for the books that I am currently reading we have Prostitute Laundry by Charlotte Shane. This was also very kindly sent to me by the publisher. There are a couple of other books in here from Serpent's Tail and Viper because they did send me an email and were essentially like would you like any of these titles and I was like yes yes I would but this was one of the ones that I was so so excited for I'm really glad it won my Patreon poll for my TBR this month so this is a memoir that entirely consists of essentially letters which were sent to a mailing list a few hundred people that were interested in Charlotte Shane's life as a sex worker and through these different like miniature essays that she was writing she explores what it's like to be a sex worker and also keep your own sexuality intact what it's like to have relationships outside of sex work. The purpose of sex work is for Charlotte Shane themselves, whether it was just for money or whether it was to fulfill other needs. I have been saying for ages and ages that I wanted to read more on the topic of sex work from the people who are actually involved in the industry themselves and not just from psychologists and sociologists and people studying the phenomenon of sex work in our society. And this book 100% serves. All of these are new books that have come into my house but then have also gone off of my TBR which we are <laughs> grateful about. And guys I want to keep the cardigan on because this is a big old cottagecore vibe but I am boiling. Turns out that talking with your hands and holding up books is hot work. Okay we definitely need to speed this process along because I still have two huge old stacks right here. The next book that I've got is a book from the publishers. It's a proof that comes out in June and it is a mystery thriller and that book is The Final Act of Juliet Willoughby by Ellery Lloyd. Ellery Lloyd are a husband and wife writing duo and a few years ago I read their debut which I think is people like me. People like her and it was an incredibly intense read which I 
ate up and while I wouldn't say that as a thriller it was game changing in any way and there are a few bits of the ending that did for me go off a bit of a cliff it was still a solidly enjoyable book it is about the runaway heiress Juliet Willoughby in Paris in the 30s she is thought to have died in a fire with her lover and his surrealist masterpiece which is a work that has gone down in art history as being like one of those big important pieces that was lost and then in Cambridge in the 90s we follow two art history students who are looking into this painting and who find some things a little bit hinky which leads us to right now in Dubai where an art dealer is accused of murdering his oldest friend and all three of these timelines weave together and I do have faith that Ellery Lloyd will be able to pull all of these threads together because they definitely did it in people like me. The next two books were kindly sent along to me by the publisher along with some of the other books that I was telling you about that I requested earlier and they are Love Me Tender and Playboy by Constance Debray. The first one is a short memoir about how Constance came out sort of midlife. She was already married, she already had children and then she realised that she couldn't live in this life anymore and it is how she kind of like carved out a new beginning for herself but also how difficult it was when you have all of these ties already. And then the second one, Playboy, is about dating women for the first time. It's about learning how to love very differently and also about learning how to have sex again as an adult who thought that they were actually quite good at that and they had that done. Playboy comes out in May of 2024 so I think I'll try and read these right at the start of next month and let you know what I think about them in case you want to pick them up. Alright so the next book that I have is one of my most anticipated books for 2024 and it is The Reappearance of Rachel Price by Holly Jackson. Holly Jackson of course wrote the Good Girls Guide to Murder series which I like everybody else in the world am dearly devoted to and this is as this hideous sticker does tell you the Waterstones exclusive edition so it has the spread end papers which I love and it is signed and it has the special first edition cover under the dust jacket. So this one is about 18 year old Belle. She has lived most of her life with one constant fact and that is that her mother disappeared 16 years ago when she was just a little kid and no one has any idea of where she went. However the fact that she disappeared has become a sensational true crime case and so at the beginning of this book a Netflix documentary series is being filmed and the camera crew are interviewing Belle. They want to know what it's like to live with the fact that your mother is just gone. And then as this documentary is being filmed, Belle's mother reappears. And although Belle really wants the crew to then stop filming to leave so that her family can work out what the hell has gone on and try and emotionally process it, the cameras instead stay and they capture some very interesting footage. I am so pumped for this and I had to stop myself with my entire body from picking this book up the second I unboxed it. And then we have a book that I picked up completely randomly when I was grocery shopping. Holy Spouse Harry had gone out for a trolley which meant that I could just kind of wander into the magazines and books area and I saw this and it came home with me. This is Stargazers by Harry Evans. Now I have never read a Harry Evans book before in my entire life life and I have never had any inclination to. They are kind of like family saga cosy mystery type things, none of which have ever appealed to me before. However, the blurb of this one just absolutely drew me in and it's because of the two settings and timelines of this one. Because the blurb starts at the back with then Fane Hall. Doesn't Fane Hall sound exactly like the creepy gothic mansion of your nightmares that you absolutely want to read about? Yes it does! The blurb says Sarah has spent a lifetime trying to bury memories of her childhood. The constant fear, the horror of her school days and Fane, the vast crumbling house that was the sole obsession of her mother Iris. A woman as beautiful as she was cruel. Just <laughs> How to hook Leanne in in less than 50 words. The book is then split between then and Fane Hall and now in 1969 when Sarah as an adult has a family, she has a career, she has run far far away from Fane Hall and she lives on a kind of run down fixer upper on Hampstead Heath where she is more than happy to be away from like the crumbling gothic elegance of her childhood. However, Fane Hall can just 
not quite ever let her go. Now let's be real, am I hoping that this book is a complete game changer, that it becomes a five stars and one of my favourite books in the world? No. I've talked a lot about the fact that I need to learn when to DNF books that are three stars and that are not ever going to be better than three stars. There's a difference between those books and books that you buy knowing that they're going to be kind of candy floss for the brain. They aren't going to change your entire world but that they are going to be kind of like fun palate cleansers that you enjoy just enough. Who knows, it might surprise me but I doubt it. Alright so next up I have a small stack of what I'm going to call special circumstances books. So first up on top of this stack you will notice that I have a bunch of paperback books and that is because I have unfortunately had to replace a couple of the books that were on my shelves which had some dubious foxing on them. Now I personally don't mind yellowed pages on my books, I don't mind fox books at all. However I went to get my copy of Mrs Dalloway off of the shelf the other day because I was like hmm I think maybe I want to reread you soon. When I picked it up I discovered that it had some very interesting foxing on it. There were also some marks on there that I was like and it was only on four books and so I decided that just to play it safe just in case one of those books because I think one of the Virginia Woolf books was second hand when I got it had brought in any kind of like book mold or damp or anything like that I just decided to remove them from my collection but that did mean that I had to replace them. I haven't yet replaced all the birds singing and I don't think I will replace After the Fire a still small voice because I didn't like it that much but I did want to replace my Virginia Woolf books and I found a set of them which were ridiculously cheap. They are the Red Spined Vintage Editions. I personally am of the opinion that these are the most beautiful ones out there. So in this stack I did of course replace To the Lighthouse which is my favourite Virginia Woolf and I also replaced Mrs Dalloway. But of course in this set there was also A Room of One's Own which is another one that I have also read but I didn't actually own previously. And also Orlando which I have owned previously and have unhauled because I'm absolutely scarred from having to study this in university so this beautiful copy will be going to one of my friends. However in this stack there was one Virginia Woolf book which I had not already read and that is The Waves so this one is not going in and off of my TBR unfortunately it is instead adding to it. But I actually kind of like that because it's been a long time since I've bought a new classic or modern classic that I hadn't read before and I don't know even if I had picked this up if I would have prioritised it particularly if it wasn't counting towards my 60% for this year. So I'm quite looking forward to this. So the other two books in here that are special circumstances are beautiful editions of books that I have already read. The first one is The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. This is the first Wizard of Oz book and it was sent to me from the lovely, lovely Sarah. In case you haven't seen these editions before, they are the Mina Lima editions, which is a pair of illustrators who have done some absolutely stunning things with some classics. So not only is every single page like beautifully and lushly illustrated, but all of the Mina Lima editions also include these like fold out or interactive elements that like go on to illustrate the story. I haven't dug into them properly yet in this book which is why all the little bits of paper to protect the pages are still in there. And then finally in this stack there is this absolutely stunning edition of The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. This is illustrated by Graham Baker Smith and it is the Fortnum and Mason copy of this book. Who do I think I am? I have never ordered anything from Fortnum and Mason before in my entire life and I probably never will again unless they bring out more of these absolutely beautiful classic editions of children's books. It took two, two illustrations to make me buy this book. Firstly this one, this is of course Toad, Ratty and Mole having dinner by the fire outside of the caravan and then this illustration of Badger, like look at it. So yeah this is one of those purchases that's like it was a little bit spenny, did I necessarily require it in my life? No but did I need it? Yes. Now moving on to another two big releases for 2024, one of which was on my most anticipated list but which I didn't pre-order and the other which came off of my most anticipated list but which I forgot to cancel the pre-order off. So the first one is An Education in Malice by S.T. Gibson. This is the one that I was super highly anticipating. It is on my TBR for this month so I'm not going to talk too much about it because I already went into the massive synopsis of this in my TBR video but essentially it is 
is a Carmilla Dark Academia retelling by S.T. Gibson who also wrote A Diary of Blood which was the Dracula and Brides of Dracula retelling that I really really loved. This like Diary of Blood is also sapphic and I am so excited for it. So my parents picked this one up for me for my birthday. I'm not gonna lie, although I'm highly anticipating this, I don't really need any of the special editions of it, so I don't mind that this is just a standard edition and I forgot to pre-order anything more special. However, the other book that I have is What Feasts at Night by T. Kingfisher. This is the second book in the Sworn Soldier series. The first one was What Moves the Dead. What Moves the Dead was a Fall of the House of Usher novella retelling and I liked it just fine. I really loved the queer twist that's in it. I felt like after finishing the first book that it definitely should have been included in a longer collection of like retellings or short stories because these just like Thornhedge that she brought out really recently are incredibly tiny and these hardbacks are not cheap. This is the American edition of this because I wanted it to match my original hardback but even the Thornhedge hardback which I think was brought out by Tor in the UK that one was like $14.99. These are not cheap hardbacks and so I decided that you know what even though it's T. Kingfisher and even though I love her a lot I don't necessarily feel any need to carry on in this series and then the ADHD ADHD'd and I promptly went on to think about something else and I never cancelled it and then this just turned up on my doorstep and I was like damn well I guess I'm reading that now. And then finally the last book that I got for my birthday is The Spare Man by Mary Robinette Kowal. My lovely lovely friend Steph at Novel Tea Corner sent this one to me. Thank you so much Steph. So this one is a sci-fi mystery and I don't actually know whether it is set in the future or whether it is kind of like a retro sci-fi like the art could easily fit in in the 50s so is it actually set in the 50s where they have futuristic technology i don't know if it's an alternative history or not but either way it is about tesla crane who is a wealthy heiress and she is currently on a cruise liner going between the moon and mars she is absolutely loving loving the fact that she is incognito nobody knows who she is so she can do exactly what she wants to do on this holiday and then unfortunately somebody on board is murdered and she along with her West Highland Terrier have to solve the mystery. However the thing that I'm really excited about about this book is not just like the setting and the mystery but also that her tiny West Highland Terrier is actually a service dog because I believe that Tesla is deaf and there is still a lack of representation in sci-fi and fantasy for people with disabilities which is actually insane especially in sci-fi when you can have any amount of differences to how they live or disability aids to help them live because you've literally just made up a future with infinite technology. I don't know people do be people and but either way I'm very very excited for this one. All right so we're officially halfway through the stacks we are on to the second stack now. It would probably be a good idea if I pulled together all of the books that I got from publishers this month but I don't know how I would extricate them from under all of the piles so we're just going to go with whatever I pick up first. And also I think it's really interesting and I I should probably note here that when I talked about the stats of the books that I own in my library now, I think I talked about that in my I unhauled one third of my library update video. I mentioned that in the past few years I have almost completely stopped getting books from publishers. Like increasingly I have said no to things that are offered from me and then lo and behold this month I did all of the above. So the one that I went absolutely out of my way to track down the publicist for is this one. This is beautiful. This is The Under History by Karen Moore. Warren. And the little tagline on it says, every room has a story. So I first spotted this on my lovely friend Olivia from Olivia's Catastrophes Stories. She was doing a little book haul there and she held up this one and I was like, oh. Because this one is a thriller about an older protagonist. You guys know that if a protagonist is over 50, I rejoice. But if they're in their like 60s, 70s, 80s, I'm like, give it to me. This one is about a woman called Paris Sinclair. When she was a little girl, a pilot purposefully flew his plane into her home. That incident killed everybody on board and also I think everybody else in Pera's family. Now years and years later, Pera has made this house her life's work. Not only has she lovingly rebuilt and restored like all of the original mansion to the best of her remembrances, she has also added other themed rooms on from people who used to live in this place. Including her sister who was murdered miles away from the house, a soldier that is in her family's history that was broken by the war. And she has made this entire house a kind of like 
Warren of themed museum rooms that people can come to and get a tour around. And then one day Pera is taking around the very last tour group which is a small young family and some men tack on to the end of the tour group that she hasn't seen before but she can tell the type of men that they are. She knows they're planning something. But as the end of the blurb says, these are dangerous men who will hurt the family without a second thought and who will keep an old woman alive only so long as she is useful. But as she begins to show them around her house and reveal its secrets, the dangerous men will learn that she is far from helpless. After all, death seems to follow her wherever it goes. This and Rachel Price, like I really want to throw all of the rest of my TBR out and just read these. Next up I have a little stack of books that were sent to me from the wonderful people at Book Break. First book that I have got from them is Western Lane by Chetna Maru and this is interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all during my February and March I can't buy books thing I saw the hardback of this in a bookshop and I almost bought it. However it's also interesting for a second reason and that is that based on the paperback of this I would not have bought this. I wouldn't have even entertained this because nowhere on this entire book is there a blurb and that is because it was shortlisted for the 2023 Booker Prize and it was long listed for the 2024 Women's Prize for Fiction so that means that apparently we only get quotes from people who think we should read it we don't get to know what it's about it's just it's in a prize it's in two prizes so you you should just read it and when I tell you that this drives me batshit insane when I tell you that this absolutely grinds my gears. You should not have to do detective work to find out what a book is about. And trust me, I looked. It's just endless, endless quotes. No blurbs anywhere to be seen. So for you, I will do the public service of reading the book from Freakin' Storygraph. 11 year old Gopi has been playing squash since she was old enough to hold a rack. When her mother dies, her father enlists her in a quietly brutal training regime and the game becomes her world. Slowly she grows apart from her sisters. Her life is reduced to the sport, guided by its serve, the volley, the drive, the shot and its echo. But on the court, she is not alone. She is with her pa. She is with Ged, a 13 year old boy with his own formidable talent. She's with the players who have come before her. She is in awe. Western Lane is about the closeness of sisterhood and the strange ways we come to know ourselves and each other. I just, guys, it, it's not a huge hardback book. It's a very small paperback book. There is no need for four pages of quotes and a back entirely devoted to quotes from Sally Rooney, The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Times and the judges of the Booker Prize. No, actually come back here it's not the book's fault I'm sorry I'm sorry I am going to read you. One that comes out in July 2024 and it is Anyone's Ghost by August Thompson. This is a queer love story that takes place over two decades between two very different boys who just happen to love some of the same bands. Now I will say that there are two things going against this book and the beautiful sample of it that I read and that is that from the very first page we know that one of these boys is dead and the second thing is that this is about bands and you know how I feel about music and fiction. I like it very very sparingly and I should just clarify here for the people who endlessly tell me this that yes of course not every book can be about queer joy. However I think that the times of using queerness solely as a vehicle for like misery and unrequited love and all of the sad things that can possibly exist in romance is over. <coughs> yes there is still a place for gay romances which do not end happily. However no, there is no longer a place for gay romances which don't include any queer joy. So if this is that one, I will let you know. I'm really hoping that it's not. I'm really hoping that it's the former. And then finally, I have a little bunch of books that I call Leanne Slipped. Again, as I've already said, I was very, very sick in March and I pretty much just let myself do anything that I wanted to to feel better. And that has resulted in this little stack, the end of this book haul. I am going to run through at breakneck speed. This is a botanical daughter by Noah Medlock and I was completely entranced by the cover like I was dragged in by the cover of this one and this is about Simon and Gregor who are described on the back as a pair of unusual gentlemen this one is set in the 19th century and it is split between Simon and Gregor's passions which is for one of them plants and their beautiful glass house which is filled with like a plethora of plants that have been transported from all over the world and are now growing here all together and for the other one taxidermy. However these two hobbies combine to accidentally create a actual 
living being made of plants. The end of the blurb says, driven by the glory he'll earn from the Royal Horticultural Society for such an achievement, Gregor ignores the flaw in his plan, that intelligence cannot be controlled, that plants cannot be reasoned with, and that the only way his plant beast will flourish is if he uses a recently deceased corpse for the substrate. I read the first couple of pages of this in the bookstore and I was like, there's no way I'm not leaving with this. Then the next two books I got in that same little bookshop trip, which was the first one that I had after I was like released from my sick bed, I also picked up Final Verdict by Tobias Buck. This one is about the 2019 trial of Bruno Day, who is one of the last people alive to be tried for war crimes during World War II. Specifically, he was accused of being an administrator, a guard and and an enforcer in a concentration camp during World War II, working of course for the Nazis. And although he is in his 90s by the point that he actually goes on trial, he denies everything, says that he has never had anything to do with any of this, and he's lived a productive and kind life and had a family and things afterwards. I, like I'm sure everybody else was at the time, was absolutely boggled watching all of the news coming out of this trial when it actually happened. Yeah, this one is going to be difficult but very interesting. And then also in that trip I picked up Missing Persons or My Grandmother's Secrets by Claire Wills. I don't know why I can't say that entire title and author in one go. This is a memoir about Claire Wills finding a photograph in her grandmother's things and in it there was a baby that she did not recognise and in asking questions about this she discovered that her grandmother was like many other women at the time in Ireland forced to give up a baby to camps that were run by the Catholic Church where they basically got rid of your illegitimate baby for you and they gave it to proper Christian people to raise and this is Claire Will's exploration of her grandmother's secrets and of her family and very very recently I've gone through this exact experience of going through records and tracking down relatives and stuff so I am very excited for this one. Then I have a bunch of true crime because I am who I am as a person. The first one is a book that I've flirted with a few times, it was actually in the catalogue of one of the publishers however they didn't have a copy to send to me and by that point I had my heart set on it so I went out and purchased it myself and that book is Dancing with the Octopus by Deborah Harding. So in 1978 in Omaha, Deborah Harding was a college student walking home and she was abducted at knife point. She was chucked in a moving vehicle, she was kept blindfolded, she was assaulted, she was ransomed but then she was just returned. However, the back of the book then says, but what if this wasn't the most traumatic defining event in her childhood? And I was like, give it to me yesterday. Give it to me yesterday, I would like it. The next book up is entirely the fault of one of my patrons, Beth, and I think it's kind of like a reverse karma thing because <laughs> a bunch of my patrons had asked me for some recommendations from my true crime shelves behind me and I gave them a lot of them and in return Beth gave me this one. And I did actually climb to the very tippy top of a ladder in toppings for this one so you know how much I wanted it. This is We Keep the Dead Close by Becky Cooper and it is about an unsolved murder at the time that Becky Cooper starts looking into this at Harvard University. Jane Britton, who was a graduate student who was found bludgeoned to death in her apartment. So when Becky Cooper started investigating this, she was actually an undergraduate and the entire case just completely boggled her and like sucked her in. And she started her own investigation. And you guys know that in true crime or in thriller or in mystery, I love nothing more than a person who has absolutely no background in doing any kind of investigating whatsoever, but who gets either fascinated or like drawn into a case and has to figure it out for themselves and that is very much this one. And then finally I have another two books that I have picked up from Toppings and you can tell that I have because they have the contact paper on them. So these two books are two books that I found out about on the exact same day completely at random. I just so happened to be on a website that sold books doing a little bit of cheeky browsing and I made a deal with myself and that deal was that if I found these books in the wild if I walked into an actual bookstore and they were sitting there I could buy them. And so uh, the first one I just happened to walk into a bookstore two days later and it was right there on the table. This is Cloistered My Life as a Nun by Catherine Coldstream and hold on this is not me going off brand with a religious memoir this is in fact more on the true crime and mystery side. It is about Catherine Coldstream who was in her 20s when her father died and her family just kind of completely fell apart and she read an advertisement for novices in the Roman Catholic Church and she ended up becoming a novice, she ended up becoming a nun. Does that sound familiar to another book here where, you know, people died 
somebody's entire life fell apart and oh they ended up in a <coughs> religious cult um maybe after years and years of thinking that this is a blissful experience that she should be taking full advantage of that she should be devoting her entire life to she can't shake the feeling that things are just a little bit wrong that things around her are just not quite right that the nuns and the way that they are acting towards each other there's just there's an undercurrent of something. This book starts with a page that says, I am running. I can't remember the last time that I ran outside, but I have to run. I recently went to St Andrews with my lovely friend Jill and it was the first time I'd been in toppings in St Andrews and it is beautiful, but it looks, it's this like tiny shop front and then it's an absolute warren of books that just continues on for miles. It's stunning, I love it. But the book that I wanted to pick up while I was there was The Chain by Chimene Suleiman. And the blurb of this is very, very unusual. I've never read anything like this before. So I'm just gonna read it to you too because I think you'll realize exactly why I picked it up pretty much immediately. So it says, in January 2017, Chimene Suleiman was on her way to an abortion clinic in Queens, New York with her boyfriend, the father of her nascent child. It was the last day they would spend together. In an extraordinary sequence of events, Chimene was to discover the truth of her boyfriend's life, that she and many other women had been subtly, patiently and painfully betrayed. And then the rest of the book is an exploration on the way in which Chimene and these other women had been duped again and again in their lives and in society into performing the role of women that society thinks that you should be. And the bookseller in Topping St Andrews was amazing because she did look this up on the computer, see that there was only one copy and then proceed to be like, run! And we ran through the entire book to the feminism section so that I got it before somebody else picked it up. So that is it you guys, those are all of the books that I have bought between February, March and the very start of April because I'm filming this like a week in. Some of these are actually like the beginning of April books but I didn't want to wait and then create an entire other haul on my TBR cart which isn't a TBR cart it's a haul cart it's where I keep books before I haul them for you guys. Somebody I'll see if I can find the comment called it my holly instead of my TBR trolley and I really kind of like that so I might be stealing that thank you for that contribution. <laughs> so now you guys will know from the graphic in the corner how many books there were in the this haul, how many have come into my library fresh since my last haul and how many of those books I have read. But let me update for you now and I don't know the numbers yet because I haven't put the last of these on my spreadsheet but here is the number of books in total that I have hauled so far in 2024 and here is the number of books that I have read out of those that I have hauled. Now I do think that this is probably going to either not change the percentage at all, we were sitting at 18% last time I calculated it, or possibly bring that percentage down a little bit but don't count me out yet because there are books in these stacks and other 2024 books from before these stacks that are in my TBR for this month so I am planning on it next time we do a tops and bottoms this number being higher because we will be like a quarter of the way through the year. So if you have got all the way through this video, then leave me a bag emoji down below, either shopping bags, a briefcase, a tote bag, a handbag, whatever you are stuffing your latest book purchases in, leave me that emoji down below. And as always, if you have read any of the books I've talked about here today and you would like to tell me whether you loved or whether you hated them, opinions live here, please do that down in the comments below. If you are new to my channel and you would like to see what I think about any of the books that I have hauled here today then please hit that subscribe button and if you are a returning subscriber who is here to support my arms lifting up all of these hefty books then please hit that like button on the way out because it really does help my channel and I will speak to you all really soon guys bye <laughs>